For me, I, th I think there are crucial things. Um, the first is that we care about the person the story is about. I think, I think from any age, if the reader doesn't like at some level or care about the person the story dies, it just falls over. I think also it needs a, um, then of course it needs some sort of problem or some sense of progress, I think. I think stories that miss that idea um, fail and, and they do it often. If it's not clear what is the thing the person is trying to overcome or the thing that opposes them so that there's some sense of conflict and, and a, a capacity for things to be okay, even if they aren't, that there's, that's a chance, that that's a live option. Um, and a great ending, you know, something that brings that together. Um, a, a really clear decision that, for the ending, so it makes sense that the whole story was working towards that point. I think it's very hard to get all three of those things. And when we're talking for young readers, most of that still holds, it's the same. And as a parent and a school teacher, I sort of have an instinct increasingly that I, as a, when I started writing, I wouldn't have had. Um, and that is, I think, a great story for young people also has hope. I think a really great story for the young allows them to see a possibility of things being better. Um, and sometimes that hope isn't even a happy ending. Um, a person can behave in a really courageous way that is admirable and things don't work out for them. But the fact that they had courage is a hopeful thing in the world. So I think for a young person, the crucial thing to avoid is a story that's cynical. It's just there for entertainment and that's all. Um, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's a precious opportunity to talk um, hope into the world for the young and let them believe that, that they can flourish, that life can be good, they can contribute to the project somehow. Um, and I think the great, great stories for the young do that. I always say, this is a question you always often get asked, of course, um, the story I remember reading most um, was Watership Down by Richard Adams. You know, the, it became a movie, it was about rabbits, and there's a, a, um, a very famous song with it, but it's a long time ago, you don't have to know. Um, and I remember it because it was the first time I'd read a novel and with total hunger. I completed it over a weekend and I remember barely moving from my bed. It was hundreds of pages long. I don't know how old I was, I imagine about 10. And I'd read other novels, but nothing of this weight. And possibly because I was reading it in one big chunk, possibly because it was much harder as a piece of reading than I'd ever read before, um, I lived in that story and, and it had that lovely, I think it's the first time I remember that lovely and awful feeling of there are only 10 pages left and I want to know how it ends but I don't want this to finish, I want this to go forever, you know. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the novel I hugely remember reading. Um, I remember as a young teenager reading The Outsiders um, and being surprised actually that some book could be written about teenagers that felt and a little bit real, a little bit like what we were interested in because suddenly as a teenager, you know, our adults, what do they know? Although in fact, the author was a teenager still when she wrote it actually, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, and that was a book that surprised me in terms of how, um, that it could be as exciting as a movie for a teenager, you know, yeah. A number of things. I think as a child, it just opened my imagination. I think there's, there's really nothing like a book, I don't think, in terms of asking you to imagine a world, particularly once you move out of picture books and it just, you've got to do the work. That was sort of crucial. Um, and then for somebody growing up in a small town in the country, um, it opened up as a teenager in my eyes a little to the world. I was very interested in what the adult world was like and, and how people behaved and a number of things. I was interested in what sex was like. I was interested in how people made friends. I was interested in you know, what jobs were enjoyable, how people dealt with conflict, just what it was to be an adult. And if you live in a little world away from anywhere, you know, and I was in a, um, in a Catholic household and people were careful about what they would talk about or not, books opened my eyes a little to the world. There was a wonderful thing with the uh, musician. I once saw an interview with Nick Cave who grew up in a very, very small Australian town and he talked about the first time he heard Leonard Cohen and going, oh, 
there's other people like me in the world. You know, the world is bigger than my town. And I think, I think literature, you know, did that to us. Uh, yeah, and it, it dealt with some boredom <laughs> at times too, yeah. I think I don't know. I think, um, I think it's, we're very good at telling why stories. And I could probably tell you quite a few. And I'd probably tell you the ones that made me sound better. Um, I think some of it is, in fact, is not so good. I think sometimes we do things we think we're good at just to show off, you know? I think that's part of why we do things. Um, writing's a hobby to me. It's an escape. Um, I've always had a full-time job. I've never been a full-time writer. And, um, and that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a relaxation. But also, I think, particularly when I'm writing things like I write plays for schools, a lot of theatre, I'm also actually trying to... Um, raise questions and get young people thinking because I'm a school teacher and that's a, a really crucial part of what I do. Yeah. I think mostly I get ideas from things that puzzle me, that I don't quite understand, that doesn't make sense to me, or things that um, make me angry in the world. I think that it shouldn't be like this, this has got to change. So I've always, uh, that sort of social conscience has always grabbed me quite strongly. Um, but puzzles get at me strongly. Um, I, like, I like the idea of rebellion, of why do things have to be this way, you know, which is why I think I like um, working with teenagers, because it's a, it's a really strong instinct for them. So things I don't quite get, the first novels I wrote were all novels about revenge and why revenge didn't work. Um, and that was a real fascination with the stupidity of this instinct that was so common. Um, Genesis, obviously, was a novel about something I didn't quite understand and fascinated me about the nature of consciousness, and that's okay, nobody understands that, so I could be part of that. Um, and I th yeah, that's what I'm, I look for puzzles that fascinate me, something that I'll still be interested in by the end of the novel when I finish writing it. I think that's what really grabs me, yeah. I got the idea really um, when I started reading a bunch of science. And I hadn't, I hadn't had much formal science education. I did mathematics for a long time, and I did economics and mathematics and history at university. But the science, I, you know, the hard sciences, I left. And so when I came back to the museum, I was sort of fascinated by this stuff and about neuroscience and evolution. And then I was very lucky, and I had a year working at a, a research um, centre in a university, which was um, a research into genetics, actually, um, and into evolution in particular. So I was just surrounded by those ideas and it was all suddenly new to me. And you know when you just find something out, you become a terrible bore. You want to tell other people and tell everybody because you assume it will be as exciting to them. Some people aren't excited. Some people have known it for 10 years already and they don't know. But, and so I think it was that sort of a thing, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I was asked to write a story for the festival and so I was looking for an angle and um, over the last couple of years, I've been working a lot with teenagers, um, taking a play around schools and um, starting conversations. And the play is about pornography and how the modern pornography culture is affecting the way young people think about or experience intimacy. And we just wanted to start conversations. And, and by talking to an awful lot of young people, you know, thousands, I guess now, around different schools, um, the issue of consent became a really important part of that as well. Um, because it's, it's very clear that no matter what one's notions of sexuality, it's the negotiation, the safe negotiation between two people, um, is, is, the, is the, the deal breaker, the thing we somehow have to work out. And we made, um, we made a whole list of points, sort of research points. I did it with another, developed it with a colleague. Well, the, one of the points we came up with when we were researching the play was, um, which led to this was and we, we say this to the um, we say this to the kids all the time is that it's you know sex is really unusual in the sense that it's one of the few social activities that's entirely hidden from the world so all our normal controls about behavior which is the group does not approve of how you work can disappear there's just two people and, and all around the world, court systems are incredibly ineffective at, at keeping people safe. 
when it comes to one word against another. Um, and so that, the level of responsibility for, and, and for care is huge, and, and yet we're often talking about young people um, who are under immense sort of developmental pressure and, and are not sure what they're doing and they're frightened. So um, conceptually, <laughs> the chip is a very good thing. I think the idea that if we behaved as if we were scrutinised, that's how most of our social behaviour is made better. In reality, um, as with any such idea, the, um, the potential for abuse would be huge. You know, the idea that people could take these memories. But actually, I, I lean heavily towards it would be good, actually. I think most of us would behave much, much better if our, um, if our activities were available for scrutiny. Yeah, that an open society is a, is a good thing, I think. I think ultimately it's going to be an enrichment for an, for an interesting reason. And that is, I think, the thing in time as we have more and more technology, and I think artificial intelligence is almost a, um, it's a very hard definition of what we even mean. But I think we mean technology that can do an awful lot of data manipulation very, very quickly for some purpose. And I think the thing that's going to happen as we deal with more and more technology all around us that can do things very quickly is we're going to come to value the things technology can't do more and more, like imagine. And I think actually literature is going to become, I hope, I think the arts. I think the arts are going to become more and more important because they're going to be a way to value and experience that thing. And, um, and the more we're surrounded by technology, the more we're going to appreciate removal from technology. That's why I think live theatre is, is in a good place right now. Um, because that close contact with another human being can't be replaced by anything. And just being there in the theatre. And it's the same as just taking some words, you know, and imagining another human being into existence and getting inside another human being's mind. I think that's that the beauty of that will become more and more apparent.